Hello, and welcome to the CSJ's Beyond Westminster podcast, where we bring you the real stories from across Britain's forgotten communities. This year, the CSJ shed light on one of the most staggering and pressing issues of our day. That is, the huge increase in severe absence among the UK's most disadvantaged children. Through in-depth research and investigation, we've uncovered that since the start of the pandemic, there are more than 140,000 so-called ghost children, children who are absent from school 50% or more of the time, many of whom have fallen off the school register altogether. This is doing incredible and untold damage from widening the attainment gap to putting more children at risk of abuse, exploitation, and falling into a cycle of crime. In today's episode, Christina Odone, head of family policy at the CSJ, leads us in a discussion about the scale and impact of this pressing issue, and crucially, what parents can do to help secure our children's future. Our guests today are Lord Watson of Invergowery, a former labor frontbencher on education and currently a member of the APPG on parental participation, May Lim, who runs the charity Reach Children's Hub, Lee Elliott Major, the professor of social mobility at the University of Exeter, Angela Dickinson, chair of the Parenting Circle charity, and Ben Gilchrist from Caritas Shrewsbury, one of seven charities that make up the Family Toolbox Alliance. On today's episode, we invite you to go beyond the sensational headlines, beyond the surface of the stories, and beyond Westminster. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now I need your help. Parents are crucial during a child's early years. They ensure the child's happiness, health, and, as neuroscience shows, their cognitive development. Many of the mechanisms by which parents transmit emotional, cultural, and social resources require contact and interaction throughout childhood. That's why schools need to engage parents. But is this happening across the board? Teachers report that parents are failing to prepare children for school, and they are arriving at school without knowing the basic of playing nicely, eating with a spoon. Some are coming in still in nappies. Ben Gilchrist works for Caritas Shrewsbury, one of the seven charities that make up the World Family Toolbox Alliance. And Ben, has this been your experience? Absolutely. What we're hearing as charities working in partnership in Wirral and and with our work more broadly across the Northwest is that that, that schools and and families are facing, yeah, huge, huge challenges. Um, And... You know, what we're really focusing on is uh, the, what are the causes of this? Uh, and, and I focus on prevention and early intervention um, because w- we know that, that families are, are doing their very best. Uh, we know that schools are doing their very best. Uh, and, and we want to make sure there's support around all of that to help people and build on, on the strengths in community to respond. So I, I particularly would, would highlight as a starting point how we, we tackle poverty together, and how we respond to a, a sort of post-pandemic environment, which has made a lot of these challenges uh, a, a lot greater and a lot more pressurised. That's absolutely our finding at the um, at the CSJ. I have to say, in our report, cracks in our foundation, uh, which was uh, a study of educational inequality, we found that just seventeen percent of teachers were confident that their most disadvantaged pupils would attain a GCSE level in maths and English. And, um, and that means that inequality in terms of education has grown post-pandemic. But inequalities begin at home. Parent socioeconomic resources, parental mental well-being, parental relationships and their involvement lead children onto very different trajectories. They widen the gaps in social mobility. The first ever professor of social mobility is Lee Elliott Major, who is working at Exeter University. And Lee, you've published a study recently which showed that half of the school readiness gap between the poorest and richest children is linked with the quality of their home learning environment. What's different about this home learning environment, Lee, between the very disadvantaged homes and the wealthier ones? 
So, you know, what we know about the outcomes of children is that around at least half of the variation in outcomes is due to outside school factors, at least half, probably more. And a lot of that is to do with what parents do, not just who they are, what, what they do. We also know that there is an increasing divide in the what I would call the home learning environment. Um, I, I like to sort of characterize this in, in simplistic terms as the sort of difference between the, the sharp elbowed, if you're going to sort of uh, use these sort of uh, stereotypes, versus the sort of hands off approach. That, that That's how I would categorize them. And what do I mean by that? Um, what, what I mean by the sort of sharp elbow uh, approach, I suppose, you know, in, in literally we call it uh, concerted cultivation. So essentially what you're doing, and this tends to happen more in the middle class households, you have to be careful of your generalizations, but it's it's certainly true in general. Uh, but those in those family households, it's not just about um, material wealth, although increasing that is an, an issue. Um, you know, how much how much basics did you can you can you get? And, and are you balancing several precarious jobs versus one you know, all that all that stuff matters but it's also about are you reading with your children in in their earliest years are you sharing books do you have regular routines you know one of the big indicators of outcomes and we don't know quite what the causal link is here but certainly there is a correlation strong correlation is having routine dinners meals in the evenings so that uh, and, and having some discussion, it's hard these days, isn't it, with all, with all the gadgets and the headphones. But um, that's certainly that sort of middle class, if you like, um, stereotype of conversation over dinner table does seem to have an impact on children's uh, development. Um, so all those things help. And, and I think the last thing I'd say about this is it's that sort of teaching children self-advocacy. So... The reality is uh, in schools and, and, you know, teachers try so hard to sort of help and provide individualized feedback to all the children in the class. But inevitably, there is competing sort of resources. So what the middle classes do very well is teach their children how to, to put their hand up, to ask some more questions, to challenge the teachers. And, and my worry with this increasing ha home learning divide that we're seeing is those children from more working class backgrounds just don't have that cultural capital, those uh, skills, really, the knowing the rules of the game to fulfill their own potential. So it is as much, in my view, about cultural divides as it is uh, material divides. They're both important. Um, and that's why I think this is such an important area. I agree. I agree. One of the things that has emerged uh, post-pandemic is that there are parents who are very willing, very very much inclusion with their children who are staying home from school. And that's a worrying new trend. And is it because they feel that in school their children are learning, learning about subjects that the parents are not comfortable with? Is it because they fear that teachers are sidelining parents on crucial issues such as children's gender, their vaccinations, um, what they do at home in, in, and in their free time? Do they feel, the, the majority of parents, do they feel that teachers are foes rather than friends? Angie Dickinson chairs the Parenting Circle charity. Angie, what have you found in your frontline experience? What have you found is the consensus among parents when it comes to their children's schooling? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that there is a consensus on this, but there's certainly a gap. Um, we know and we you know, everybody knows how important parents are. Um, and as Lee alluded to earlier, absolutely critical to outcomes in education. Um, studies show that, um, that parental skills and, and parental engagement is actually more important to outcomes than variations in school quality. Um, so absolutely parenting skills should be our focus. Um, at the Parenting Circle, we've worked with 
a number of partner schools to explore this issue. And they describe um, parents who, for several reasons, um, are contributing to the widening gap. Um, some of that is to do with attendance. And we know um, that you know, it was a problem before the pandemic, but post pandemic, um, there's a real crisis of attendance looming. And Christina, you talked about parents colluding uh, with young people um, not to attend. Um, and that's certainly something that some of our partner schools have identified um, that the, um, the pandemic lockdowns in some way broke the social contract about where your children have to be. Um, and rebuilding that, I think, is going to take. A lot of time and a lot of effort so certainly absenteeism is, is a huge issue and um, that links to the cultural things that, that Lee was talking to um, that gap with some working class parents uh, for whom their own educational experiences were not fantastic. They themselves were excluded. You know, schools in the in the 80s and early 90s were, were very different environments to they are now and um, and some people, you know, they weren't as inclusive and some people feel very excluded by it and bring that baggage with their families and, and that's projected onto their children. Um, and we've seen that actually um, in my own uh, professional life, I've seen um, uh, the impact as well of the cost of living crisis exacerbating this as uh, young people particularly young working class boys you know that most vulnerable group in education um, are feeling the irrelevance of education and the pressure to be out earning and we've actually seen drop off of of teenage boys at sort of 14 15 just wanting to be in the workplace and their families valuing that more than their education at the moment um, so that's a real challenge and the other kind of side of it aside from the cultural things is the mental health of young people and the mental health of their parents and we identify that through our work as being really key to um, this kind of breakdown in the contract between parents and schools uh, that sense that that we're not able to deliver what young people need. And we know there's a mental health crisis. There's statistics that say that, you know, in, in a class of 30, six of them um, will have, six of the young people will have a mental health issue. Um, and that's an enormous problem for schools to, to feel that they're dealing with and, and parents feel let down by that. So that's another area where that relationship between schools and parents is quite challenging. For homework, I had to go to the shop to buy any type of fruit that I had not tried before. My mummy took me. Angie refers to a social contract between schools and home, between teachers and parents. Lord Watson is vice chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Parental Engagement. Lord Watson, what has your group learned about parental engagement? Well, thank you. Uh, I um, Let me just say, in, in, in regards to what Angie has just said, that, that, that almost everything that she uh, has reported as, as her findings and experiences have been reflected in the all-party group in, in, in Parliament. Um, and it's been, uh, these issues have been, I think, pointed up very much by lockdown and the pandemic. And I, I've, I've advanced a view which might initially seem a bit strange, that there was a benefit from COVID. And that benefit was that um, parental engagement during that period was at an all-time high, simply because it had to be. Um, uh, many parents, uh, albeit reluctantly originally, uh, initially, um, became active participants in their children's education, where that was possible, of course, and, 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 and the, the main issue maybe is that in many in many homes that was not the case but where uh, the, the the devices necessary to enable education to continue to some extent during the lockdown were there I, I think that that involved a lot of parents who had never before really engaged in the education um, uh, um, process perhaps as Angie said because they themselves didn't have particularly positive uh, experiences in their own education so it provided um, some parents uh, with the opportunity to, to interact with, with uh, teachers. I can only, I, I'm going to personalise this because I, I, I had my son who was in year four uh, uh, at, the, and, at the time and we had, we had um, 
certainly the ability to interact with teachers in a way that we didn't have other than that by going in to meet them at the school prior to that. But of course, the downside is that there were many people, uh, young people who were not in that in the, 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 the position of either having the, um, the uh, uh, various devices available to continue education, and even where they did, of, often uh, home, in, home settings, home environments were, were not conducive to that at all for a whole uh, number of, of reasons. And of course, anxiety and stress continued because many, many families, uh, anxiety and stress continued just because everybody was um, together for huge parts of the day and much more than normal. So I think if there was a good side in terms of parents becoming, uh, seeing that they could become engaged in their, their children's education, there was a, a downside is that so many children have lost out since the pandemic and are now in a, a position where they're uh, either uh, uh, unable to uh, recover the lost learning or unwilling to. And that, that's some of the people that, again, that Angie referred to. And I think the 100,000, I think it is, figure of those who are um, now... Uh, out of school more than they're in is, is a, a, a t tremendously worrying figure and it's pr probably going to get uh, larger as time goes on. So within our all-party group, what we've tried to do, and of course Lee has addressed us and supported us on, on a number of occasions and we've we had access to his uh, research on that. Um, and we, but we also I have to say, I have to pay tribute to a group called Parent Kind, which provides the secretariat to our all-party group. And does some 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 great work in terms of uh, the, the the steps necessary for schools to make sure that they do uh, reach out to parents. And I mean, they, they they do they do regular parent surveys, and they have produced a blueprint for um, parent friendly schools. And it, I'm not going to go through that, but one of the one of the issues is um, that they stressed effective two way communications, and that if there's going to be parent engagement in involvement in whatever that. Uh, shape that takes. It has to be a two-way process. Not only do parents have to be willing to come forward, schools have to be welcoming and saying, yes, we hear what you're saying and we're willing to engage with you and discuss the issues either about the school in general or your child in particular. So th there's more that I can say about the group, but we're looking into those issues and certainly in the post-pandemic there, there is uh, much that is very worrying. What we've seen since the pandemic is uh, an incredible rise in the in the number of children who are staying away from school and in fact the center for social justice is doing a tracker to find out not only who these children are but where are they which is an absolute um, key a crucial element in this persistent absence because if they're not in school could they be endangering their lives or somebody else's life? Could they be um, uh, self-harming? Could they be playing on games, etc., etc.? So May, May Lim runs the REACH Children's Hub based in Felton. And you've, you have been able to set up a hub within uh, the school grounds of REACH Academy Felton that I saw firsthand was able to act like a magnet, not only for the parents of the, the school children, but also for the, for the wider community. May, can you tell us a little bit about how you've been able to reach these uh, parents who, on, on the face of it, seem to be so disengaged uh, with education in the first place? Um, yes, thank you, Christina. So we would argue um, as a starting point about the importance of changing the rhetoric that is so often used. So this idea that parents are hard to reach, um, because when you change your language, it obviously helps to shift mindsets. And so parents aren't hard to reach. We are. And if we start with that point, it makes us think about the barriers to engagement, whether they're physical or material or psychological, that we need to be aware of and then work to dismantle. And it's interesting that you mention um, the hub being based on the school grounds, because actually a big part of the work for us was thinking about going to where people were and actually going out into the community and meeting people where they were, rather than at, to begin with expecting them to come into the school for reasons that have already been mentioned by um, other people already and, and the, the challenges that parents can face when being asked to come back into school. 
Uh, Lee has also written about the need for schools to form non-hierarchical, mutually respective relationships with parents. And again, we do that very simply at REACH by calling everyone by their first names. So parents, staff and students are all referred to as by their first name. And that immediately removes that hierarchical barrier. And in the Children's Hub, we actually asked our parents what they would like to be referred to. And together we decided on the term partners or we also often refer to ourselves as a family. And so we never use terms like client or beneficiaries when talking about parents. So just that point about, you know, language matters. It helps us shift from a deficit-based approach to an asset-based approach when thinking about parental engagement. And once you've then removed those barriers to engagement, the, the thing to do is to really listen and to listen in a way that is doesn't feel extractive. And I think that was so key what Lord Watson was referring to in terms of the need for two way dialogue and that really meaningful communication and what you put in place, the systems and processes to be able to do that. Um, because otherwise we so often make well-intentioned plans based on assumptions about what we think parents need or what parents should do. And we don't put in the time and the groundwork to really listen to them first. And then we are surprised when things don't go to plan and people don't turn up to our really well-organized meetings. Uh, so we set out to actively listen to parents and um, we focus, what that means is really focusing on building parental capacity. So in practice, reducing parent stress, finding opportunities to build their capabilities. Parenting, parenting Circle is a really great example of that. So bringing people together to form their own peer networks and facilitating spaces where we can nurture parents. And in the Children's Hub, we are always thinking about how we can intentionally hold parents in mind and model those positive attuned relationships for them so that they in turn can have the headspace and the knowledge to build those relationships with their children at home. But what schools then need to do, and, and this was the, again the case at REACH, where the first member of staff they actually hired 10 years ago when the school was opened was a family support worker. And that family support worker is still there now and they work really closely with us in the children's hub. But, you know, it's that it's it's this is our vision and we are going to therefore invest resources in delivering that and I think parents and we know it will take different amounts of time for different for different people and different families but there is a consistency of approach there is a consistency there is a reliability that when we say we're going to do something we do it and if we say we're going to work relationally with people and we're going to take the time to listen to them um, and walk alongside them so to, I just to your last point about um, we may meet people outside and, and in our groups or in activities by going to where they are, but then we are also setting up events or structures or opportunities for them to come into school and to, to build it, whether that's through getting to know you dinners or bonfire events on the, um, or, you know, th those all those sorts of things that schools do so well. But how we're able to bring people into that and the, the work that the Children's Hub does to kind of broker and, broker and bridge some of those um, relationships and vice versa with the school and the hub works really well for us. Ben, Ben Gilchrist. I don't think we've used the word trust very much yet, but it, it's relational, as you say, and it's about trust. And, and the importance of recognising, sadly, a deficit of trust for a whole range of, of complex but really significant uh, reasons some of that well well placed frankly some of it um about assumptions so you know and that's that's sort of two ways at least you know in all directions between partners but may i, I love your, your emphasis on language mattering um and and then with that as well i i suppose our our message consistently and i hope what we're seeing in Wirral particularly but but then in our wider work is there's just so many fantastic charities, voluntary groups, community groups, faith groups, social enterprises who, who are doing this work, uh, this family support uh, and, and able to sort of have that reach, you know, within communities and that partnership with schools to, to bridge the gap. So it, it's sort of that appeal to, to remind people to reach out. You know, Angie's obviously represented that to it. Uh, you know, there, there are the solutions are there in community, uh, in families, and, and we need to sort of take that strength-based, that asset-based approach continuously. So a positive rather than a negative approach, asset-based rather than an endlessly antagonistic approach. When mummy took me to the shop, I felt excited that I would get to try something new. Lord Watson. I'd like to bring into the discussion the, 
what I see is a, a clear difference in primary schools and secondary schools in terms of attitudes to parents. And obviously I've got some personal experience, recent personal experience here. Uh, I, I, I find a primary school very welcoming. Any time there was an issue with my son, I would contact the school and they said, yes, come in. Um, his teacher will stay behind after school and have a chat with you. And uh, if you wanted to meet the head teacher, even you could as well. And, 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 very, and that was a two-way process because the, um, the school was very open and good in communicating. At secondary school, it's, it's really quite different. And I give, and I give an example that um, uh, my wife and I are going to our uh, son's parents' evening next week. Well, well, we'll not be going anywhere. We'll be sitting at home because it's online. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not, I mean, that's quite common, but it's not the only way of doing it. For instance, we looked at three schools uh, before we decided which one we wanted to put them forward for. The other two schools have in-person parents' evenings. And I don't mind the fact you get a sheet of paper sent to you that's got 10 teachers and you get five minutes with each. And of course, you can't put the teacher under any pressure because he or she has got to move on to the next person. That, they're five minutes. So it seems to me to be a very managed process. And I haven't experienced it yet, but my, my, my impression is not managed particularly well. And another issue I wanted to raise was, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of, a, 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 well, there would be various apps um, but all parents at my son's school have an app called Go For Schools, for being the Go For Schools. And that gives us two or three times a day updates on his homework, whether he's done it or not, um, how much is set for the next seven days. And in a sense, that's positive, but it's entirely one way. You can't respond and saying, uh, I think we did that last week or something. Have you, why have you not set something different? And it's all done from some central base in Cambridge. and We're in the, out, the, the outskirts of London. Um, so, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's all very good to get those, that kind of information, but it, I don't regard that as involvement or, or, or engagement. That's just information. It's, not, it's useful information, but I don't regard it as a substitute for being able to have a word with a teacher uh, if an issue is there. And this is, a, this is something that in, in our group in Parliament, we've had so many examples of this. And some parents actually been having made clear to them when they approach the school that they're unwelcome. Um, that there is a parents' evening, you know, one a year, for goodness sake, not even one a term, one a year. So I think there's, there's a big gap there and I think what parents have a right to expect. I've got something else I wanted to say about uh, one of the surveys the group did, but I'll, 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 I'll sit back for a minute and let others um, have their say. But uh, I, I think there's a, the, the difference between secondary and primary schools is, is, is a divide I don't think has to be there. I think secondary schools can be welcoming without necessarily putting themselves in a position where they're overwhelmed with parents arriving on the doorstep. Angie Dickinson, as a former teacher at a secondary school. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to sort of come in on, on what Lord Watson is, is talking about there. And I think we've identified that transition between primary school and secondary school as a real kind of crunch point um, for all of the issues that we're talking about today. Um, and um, certainly on, when I've done some research on, on persistent absenteeism, uh, we've seen that parents' anxiety around that transition um, and around the kind of enormous gap between what you've described in primary school and then and then what they get in secondary school. It feels like a cliff edge to a lot of parents. And if children are anxious and if parents are anxious, and we know that a lot of them are, then that creates a problem. And um, I know that um, in my previous school, um, we had... Uh, children on roll um, in year seven and year eight who had never attended secondary school because they were too anxious to come to school but there was no sort of other alternative placement for them but they were too anxious to come to school and it's all about that cliff edge and I think smoothing transition between primary and secondary school is a really really important way of doing this and reassuring parents and maintaining contact with parents is absolutely critical um, so 100% agree with that point. I'm really interested as well, Lord Watson, in your um, kind of differentiating between parental engagement and parental involvement. Um, and those words, I think, I mean, we said a lot about words being important, but I think the, the nuances between those words is, is really important. And at the moment, Schools are targeted and Ofsted inspects them based on parental engagement. That is how the parent uh, engages with the school. It's not about how the parent is involved with their child's education. Uh, schools are not targeted in terms of that. Um, and so there's, a, I think there's work to be done in terms of describing what quality involvement is rather than a an app that sends you a, 
sends you a, a smiley face three times a day or something. That is not involvement. That is one way communication. And I think that's really important. And Lee, that echoes some of your own findings in your latest research on social mobility. It's lovely to hear all, all these uh, wonderful people who are, who, are, who are sort of leaders, I guess, trailblazers in many ways. I mean, but the thing that's resonating, you know, sort of rebounding in my head is how do we do this across the system? That's always the challenge, right? That's always the challenge. And I think language is so important. And, um, you know, so I would probably call it parent partnerships now, I think. I, I, I think about these words all the time because, as May was saying, too often, and I think we all do this, we fall into deficit um, mindset in, in this space. And, you know, based that, I mean, so so I think we should do with rather than do to. And, and it was lovely hearing uh, what Reach doing uh, because, you know, I get asked lots of questions about, you know, so how should we do parent partnerships? And there's loads of little tricks you can do about personalising texts and having parent champions from the community. There's always a... But I think fundamentally it comes back to that relationship uh, piece. And, and if you don't get that trust, um, and, and I think that a lot of that's been broken, as we've said, I think it was already, by the way, um, uh, breaking before the pandemic. I, I, think, I think the pandemic accelerated this. I think there's deep suspicion among many communities about the value of schooling. Um, I think we need to mend those relationships, but that has to be done in, in, a, in a genuinely partnership uh, sort of approach so you know I know these all sounds like sort of jargony words you know non-hierarchical so hierarchical relationships relational rather than transactional but honestly it is so central and we don't train teachers to uh in any of this by the way we don't train teachers in in how they uh work with parents that we don't we don't even train teachers about the inequalities in society I mean we, we, yeah we have a current system that sort of almost says well we're not we, you know poverty is an excuse so we're going to kind of ignore it you know i just don't think that works i think you of course you know poverty shouldn't uh um limit um someone's development opportunities but at the same time i think as a profession we need to acknowledge that it exists you know so um so i think it you know for me it's the question for us all is how do you take good practice that we're hearing here uh, and replicate across that system but what as i said what i what i'd emphasize is it's about that that core relationship and how we build that up and that speaks to all the debates about school absences as well um you know i i fear that we'll go into um a debate around what are the tricks to get these children back into school when actually it's probably a more fundamental debate about um the, these relationships thank you ben uh, leah i totally agree that it's got to be about the system and systems um uh, and yeah some really really big questions big challenges there because I, I i just i you know i can really see from a personal level to to our organizational work you know the the pressure on teachers on schools and the way that such important work of parent partnership approach is squeezed out massively and big questions about the value of of that that whole educational system and the questions we absolutely have to ask about poverty as a fundamental driver and foundation in these challenges uh, at, at risk of adding to that complexity but it's important isn't it, to recognize there's so many complex interlocking pieces to this we haven't said a lot yet about special educational needs and disabilities um it, you know huge uh you know, issues for families, for society, for schools, not least in attendance. And I suppose that especially brings out the system because surely if there's one area that everyone can conclude this is not working is systems around SEND, um, uh, diagnosis. You know, we, we provide so much support to children and particularly parents who are just at their wits end um, in terms of they're, they're doing their absolute best to, to love and care for their children and the ability for that to interact with the education system is is just you know incredibly incredibly difficult so uh, that's obviously the uh <laughs> that isn't the asset um but but yeah the, the parents commitment is there um there, there's plenty of good 
practice in schools trying to find solutions. Um, and, and I suppose, again, I'd, I'd wave that flag for our part of it in, in the voluntary sector of saying those models around peer support and that experience in, in building trusting relationships and the space and the privilege we have to do that are, are key components of, of the solution. And there is a lot of, there is a lot of capacity. There's a lot more need. There's a lot more that we want to do, but there is a lot of capacity out there um, if, if we can connect together. And if we can persuade councils to commission the voluntary sector to come in and wrap their arms around parents, teachers and children. Um, May Lim, as the director of one of the most successful children's hubs, would you like to share some of your insights? Thank you, Christina. And just on that final point, I think um, it is encouraging that the Family Hubs agenda um, is supporting councils to think about, and you know, it's explicit in that, that they have to work with schools and community organisations and, of course, parents as well, um, local councils. So I think, you know, hopefully we might see some movement in that direction um, go over the next couple of years. I just to Lee's point about, you know, how are we or how can we replicate some of this work across the system? I thought it might be helpful to just share two of our pieces of work, um, which we are doing with sort of over 20 plus multi-academy trusts across the country, um, which also touches on Lord Watson's point about transition. So we we have a, a program called Cradle to Career Partnerships because the Cradle to Career model is, is absolutely core um, for our work in Feltham. And uh, we, you know, we have an all through school, as I mentioned before, at Reach Academy. And we, we recognise that that's not um, possible for, for all, it's certainly for existing schools, but what absolutely is possible is to support those secondary schools and where you have multi-academy trust with secondaries and primaries to build that uh, approach um, to build those relationships between feeder schools, primary feeder schools, into secondary schools, and the you know the, the, the most exciting bit apart about this is that just as Ben mentioned that there's huge commitment from parents and and willingness to want to better support their children and know how to do that. There is likewise so many people in the profession and school leaders who also want to do this work and and are doing it. There's so many bright spots, but are also thinking about how do we how do we um, smooth that transition and and make that whole kind of educational pipeline really robust and work better for more of our children and then the the second part so whilst we're working with schools and multi-academy trusts we're also thinking about that in terms of leadership development so we have a program in the southwest um, which lee has been supporting with as well so the southwest 100 where we aim to um, train the next 100 head teachers uh, for schools in the southwest and the reason that I think that is uh, what we're trying to do differently from other leadership programs is we build modules around community, around relationships. Like what does, you know, those are explicit modules that are then being um, delivered and discussed with senior leaders and, or, um, you know, aspiring head teachers so that when they then take up those positions, they are already thinking about how do we work across the community? How do we work with our parents and all the other assets in our community um, in a really relational way? And, and that is different. Uh, so, yeah, those are the two things I've just been thinking about whilst listening. So parents become assets in the community and new head teachers will look beyond the walls of their school into the wider community. Lee, do you think that that could, as a kind of new engine for social mobility, work in more localities than, than just Feltham? It's, it's, it's always the, the question, isn't it? I mean, I think May and and others are brilliant. I have to say that. I mean, yeah, you know, I visited. I'm from Felton, by the way, so I've got a particular bias to all of them. But I wonder. I, I hope. I hope through their work that we can find some core things that all schools could do. I'm slightly worried that they're so good that it's going to be hard to replicate. And I'm not just saying that, May, because you're here, honestly. Um, uh, and I, I wonder if there's some core. Because schools are so stretched. They are so stretched. I do think that they're spending a lot of time, by the way, and Lord Watson will know this. 
on things that probably aren't that effective to be frank you know so there's a lot of parent meetings that I don't think are particularly uh, well done so when I when I'm in this space I'm trying to think about how I work with schools to say okay what are you doing now and how can we do that differently and look at models like uh, the reach the cradle to career model so I think it is doable but I think we've got to find those core things the other thing I'd challenge us all on and, and I'm thinking a lot about this um, uh, is how we challenge school cultures themselves so i think this the stuff that reach does is great uh, yeah but, but as a whole i still think that it's it the, the classroom can be quite alienating to a lot of uh children and families who don't come from the sort of core middle class uh backgrounds and so the way that we write our curricula I, I would say you know the way that we work in classrooms um the language we use um i think we could probably actually challenge ourselves a bit more um on, on how inclusive generally our schools are so that would be the other piece that i would look at final thing i'd say um uh, i do think we and 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 you know it's great to, to have Lord watson here you know one of those exceptions here but i don't think politicians are doing enough on this i've spoken to number 10 as you know christina many times over the years there is a real anxiety around nanny statism you know telling parents what to do Many uh, teacher leaders I speak to are very worried about imposing middle class values on families. You know, there's all sorts of anxieties. Um, but for me, this is the taboo topic of social mobility. And it's something that we just have to confront, because if we don't, I'm afraid we'll be in the same position we are in a generation's time. I really believe it's that important. I so agree. Lord Watson, having just been praised as a unique style of politician. But I, I think the ready aspect is, is perhaps the most important. A child, when he or she arrives at school at the age of four, is ready to begin learning. I'm reminded of, uh, I think it was Maslow's theory that um, uh, a child has to have their basic needs met before they're in a position to meaningfully learn. And, and, and so a child appear, appearing at school, and incredibly, story, some unable to even write their name when they appear at school, uh, you know, how, how can that child then be in a position to begin to learn? So that's, that is, is indeed a worry. And um, I, I, I hope that um, politicians do have a role to play in trying to um, address the issues of early years. And whilst it's not going to be a party political broadcast and you, would, you would, might not have, you, you wouldn't have failed to notice that the Labour Party has not been particularly open about what it will do if and when it comes to government. But early years has been highlighted as an issue in, in terms of the education portfolio, which I'm very pleased about. So that does seem to be some a, a, an area that's been identified and that is being developed, uh, hopefully to be rolled out um, uh, at some time in the not-too-distant future. Angie? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to really come in there with this idea of, of this really being a, a job for policymakers. I mean, there's a lot of um, really brilliant pockets of work being done, and, and everybody in this space today is talking about some you know fantastic projects um but there is that sense that um there's no kind of guiding from the center about what best practice looks like um how much capacity schools should be giving to this and you know we, we've already touched on how unbelievably stretched the education system is that uh, you know trying to meet with with parents and things you know if you teaching a seven hour day or which some some of us are it's 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 a really tricky area um but i just wanted really to take the opportunity to celebrate some of the great stuff that is happening in those pockets and to sort of ask policymakers to have a look closely at what is being done and give guidance really so kind of support us and and share this best practice that that we're all kind of modeling here and, and kind of give schools the drive and the emphasis that they need and the capacity that they need in order to deliver some of this stuff. So for example, at the Parenting Circle, um, we've recently collaborated with the City of London and their circle of schools, or the family of schools. Um, uh, they asked us to, to build a toolkit for them to deal with um, parental engagement, parental involvement, um, looking at the, the four kind of core elements, which I think are feature everything that we've talked about today communication that being a two-way street celebrating young people celebrating their families celebrating their community so it's a positive thing um, building a community amongst those parents as well I think is so important and I think at the heart of the mental health crisis that we're facing is a 
is, is that breakdown of communities and then the fact that people feel unsupported and the other side of, of being unsupported is that there's also little accountability you know we all need somebody with their eyes on us sometimes you know parenting is tough and I think that kind of community offers support but also accountability which is is so important and the, the fourth part of, of our toolkit or the fourth focus of our toolkit is focusing on, on opportunity this is about your children's opportunity how can you be involved in driving those opportunities so there's lots of fantastic work going on but I just really hope that we can get the ball rolling and, and get this on the at the front of, of everybody's minds a true parent-teacher partnership more covenant than contract, needs schools to adopt a strategy that goes out to parents, sees them as assets rather than barriers to children's learning. It builds trust between these two key children champions, parents and teachers. Only by joining forces can we support children's flourishing. And that is what parental engagement is all about. If you'd like to hear more, subscribe to our channel for more interesting content like this and follow us on Twitter at CSJ Think Tank for more updates.